peel back the onion, as you peel back the layers of our lives, we thank you, Father, for what you're doing. We thank you for peeling back those things that you want to remove from us. You are circumcising our hearts, Abba. We don't have to worry about others. We need to be worried about ourselves. And I thank you for that opportunity, Father, that you've given us to do a spiritual audit on our own personal lives and to begin to chip away at it and work at it and not have shame and guilt and condemnation, but to have a purpose to chip away at those things that we want to do better at. Thank you for that, for everyone in this room right now, for all, you, all your sons and daughters. There is hope. Hope is the anchor of your soul. And I am hoping for, for them as I'm hoping for myself. Thank you, Father, for just being with us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I, uh, sometimes I get to have some teachings in advance or get to go look at a, a, another few Shabbats down the road and stuff. So I want to share with you that uh, at this time, uh, I want you to make sure that you have Rediscovering the Holy Spirit outline. Okay? This is a Rediscovering the Holy Spirit outline. This is a great resource to have for yourself. Uh, what I love about this teaching is that it's really personable for you. So when you see all these examples and you see all these great things happening in the Bible, I want them to happen for you. You know, I really want them to happen for you. So rediscovering the Holy Spirit, I'm going to take you to seminary. Seminary. You know, and, and I want to just tell a quick story because I'm going to, you learn from your past. You learn from your mistakes. Okay, so I picked up from another minister that I didn't go to seminary, I went to cemetery. And we all laugh and we say this, but literally it happened at Beit Tehila. Somebody brought a cousin or a relative, and when I said that, he looked over at his and said, I'll never come back here again. He went to seminary. See, we have to be careful with our words. Because, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. It's, you know, we make a joke about the church and seminary. But let me tell you something. I learned my lesson. After that, I just pray for forgiveness. That I said the wrong thing. And it was degrading. Somebody has gone to seminary. Amen. I talked to Pastor Daniel Stahl. He went to seminary. And he actually had the privilege of being in classes with Rick Warren. So it's interesting, isn't it? Very interesting. So I can't say it enough, you know, about just being honest with ourselves. It's such a great place to be. And find accountability. You know, I, I have accountability. Find some, some friends, some people you can pour your life into, you can talk to, like, hey, I'm struggling, I need some help, amen. Because it's a game changer, amen. You know, if you want a friend, show yourself friendly. And, and a, friend, a friendship is it's reciprocal, it's reciprocation. It's, I believe Tom is my friend, and, and Tom's my friend because I give to him, and he gives a lot more to me. But friendships are so important in the days in which we live. Hear me out on this. One of the tactics, thank you, Holy Spirit, one of the tactics of the enemy is to destroy our relationships to the point of you don't trust anybody and you don't even go to church anymore. And then who wins? The enemy. So we have to overcome our offenses. We have to overcome those difficulties and value one another enough to know that we're going to be honest. Honest. I practice this all the time. If I have an offense, I will go to you. Amen. If it be possible, be at peace with all men. I'll never forget John Bevere quoted, I think it's in Romans. Isn't that the best thing to, to, sometimes you can't be at peace with some people. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You try and you try, you just, it's not working. So I want to encourage you as, as I go through this with you, you got to, it, it's like this, you know, I can't use this pulpit to tell you all the things that are wrong. I want to tell you about the things that are right. I don't want to come here in the pulpit and talk about things and, and criticize everything. You know, the church this and the church that, the government this. We don't have that much time. So I want to encourage you that. I, and, and here's the thing. And this is where it comes down to you personally. This is just the bottom line. You have to be disciplined enough to know when you're in the world and when you're not. 
We know that we're in the world, but we're not of it, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you is that if you really think about your phone or social media or the culture in which we live, it's a hodgepodge of everything. Now hear me out on this. Now when you look at something, you hear something, they've already scientifically proven this, your brain files everything you look at and everything you hear and see everything. It actually files it. It's a big computer up here, right? Giant computer. Your brain's a giant computer. So that's why you have to be careful when you just start scrolling and looking and just seeing and listening to everything because your brain's filing all that. And then in your subconscious, it pulls you down because that's what you downloaded. I'm trying to tell you this because I tweaked a few things in my life and now I feel like I'm hearing more from God. I feel like I'm more inspired. I'm more encouraged. I have more energy. Amen? And, and I want to encourage you in this endeavor. I'm not saying give up everything, don't do this, don't do that. But I tweaked a few things. I'll tell you, when Aaron Hood was here and he was ministering and I was sitting over there, he really ministered to me some areas of my life. And I went and I took action. I did. I took personal action. I'm not going to get into all of it. But there's those things that we kind of like, ah, oh, you know, I need to kind of, I need to probably stop doing that. And I'm only telling you this because had Aaron not come, I would still be where I was. How will they know unless they're set? So we receive from one another. I'll tell you, this service was off the charts. I'm telling you, this service, coming together, the inspiration, I mean, you've got, I mean, Bill Carter was outstanding. I mean, that was like, that was a good word. You know, I mean, even, even Robert, the Seventh-day Adventist, that was outstanding, right? You know, Libby's up there with Josiah, and the guy's hitting the, you know, Josiah's just, and I looked at my wife, I said, oh, look, that's me. And it ain't Josiah. <laughs> I'm down in the container. But see, if we stayed home, what would beat it? I stayed home because this happened. You won't beat that, what happened today. Because it's of God, it's the kingdom, and it's spiritual. See, we want to get into the spiritual things because the, the flesh is trying to drive the car. So we're going to kind of jump in here. It might seem like a lot, but this is actually like going to seminary. This is like taking a little class. So if some of you are, are wondering, you know, you need to know that this is put together so that you can go over it and you can claim these things. Start making declarations. I started thinking, well, if, if these people get those things, what do we get? A thousand times more. A thousand times more. So rediscovering the Holy Spirit, here we go. Four aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit to bring evidence of God's presence and to bless. Number one, the Holy Spirit empowers that's what my father-in-law used to do, Pastor Randy. Power! Yeah, he's feeling the power now, right? <laughs> Holy Spirit empowers. How many of you could use that? Oh, I need that right now. Number two, the Holy Spirit purifies. Come on, somebody. The Holy Spirit purifies. You know what I love about the modern-day washers today, man? They got a little compartment for OxyClean. Well, yeah, you put the OxyClean in there and you hit that little OxyClean button, let them know that OxyClean's coming to purify your undies. They're going to be clean. I even put it in with the darks. OxyClean, purify. Yeah, we love that when it's closed. What if it, what if it was you? No, nah, man, I'm good. Don't throw me in the washer. Right? How about this? Oh, man, we're out of fabric softener. Where's the fabric softener? <laughs> The Holy Spirit reveals. Now hear me out on this. If you're in the culture, you're on your phone all the time, it's hard for the Holy Spirit to reveal anything to you because you've downloaded so much of the world, God can't get in. I'm telling you from my own heart. You know, there, you know even in regards to Hyovel or the Waller family, the Hood family, the Hiltons, you know, uh, it's my, my, they don't even have a TV. I think, I think Aaron had a flip phone. 
And we mock that and laugh at that. Oh, look, you're so, you know, whatever. I guarantee you he's closer to God than I am. I'm just trying to help you out because, see, it's a personal decision that every one of you are going to have to make every day. When I leave here, what am I going to do? What's my, what, what am I going to do when I go home? What am I doing when nobody's around? You are who you are when you're alone. That's who you really are. Number four, the Holy Spirit unifies. It unifies. Now, this is from the book Systematic Theology, an introduction to biblical doctrine by Wayne Grudem. Excellent theologian, Wayne Grudem. Excellent, excellent resource that we have out there in the marketplace. Systematic theology. What is systematic theology, Pastor Nick? I'm glad you asked. Systematic theology is any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about any given topic? So today we're looking at the Holy Spirit. So from Genesis to Revelation, we're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit based upon the Word of God. Okay? So we're going to look at the Holy Spirit based upon the Word of God. See, and you thought you weren't going back to school. How many of you know that I'm a student, not a scholar? Amen? I'm a workshop, not a showcase. I'm a student of the Word. I'm a student. Number one, here we go. The Holy Spirit empowers. Whew. Listen, I do feel the Holy Spirit in here today. No, I'm telling you, I, I had to go put my headset on. I, 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 I had to go slow. I was like, Whew. you know, that's how you know you've experienced God. You feel light. Because see, my yoke is easy. Remember what Yeshua said? But we've been carrying the work, the yokes of ourselves and the world and all our troubles. He gives life in the realm of nature. It is the role of the Holy Spirit to give life to all animate creatures, whether on the ground or in the sky and sea. Psalm 104, verse 30. We're going to be reading scriptures out loud because whatever you speak comes towards you. All right, let's read it. Psalm 104, verse 30, empowers. We're going to read that very First verse empowers. Here we go. Psalm 104, 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit. They are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. There's some good verses in here, I'm telling you. This guy, Wayne Grudem, he did all the work for us. How many hours do you think he put together to put a thousand-page systematic theology book about the subjects in the Bible? How many hours do you think he put into that? Ask Libby how many hours she put into counting the Omer book. But we get the benefits. We get the benefits, and they, we give them the accolades and the attaboys because, man, they just really did something good. The Holy Spirit can give us new life in regeneration. The Holy Spirit can give us new life in regeneration. John chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. It means to be born from above. God is a spirit and you have a spirit. And when that happens, that is the born again experience. It's not going down the aisle. It's not just giving your life to the Lord. It's when your spirit and God's spirit meet and you know that something happened. Because you believed in God, but you weren't born again. See, I was a backslidden Catholic. I believed in God. I love God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Blessed Mary, Mother of Jesus. I did. But, but I wasn't born again. And I knew the difference when it happened in March of 92. I was almost 25 years of age. Amen. He gives power for service. He gives power for service. Think about it. Let's all be honest. When I get more of the Holy Spirit, I do more godly things. Would you agree? If I get more of the Holy Spirit or I get in his presence or I go to a service and I leave there and I, I feel like, man, I want to serve God. I want to pray for somebody. You know, I'm going to read Obadiah because it's only one chapter. Now, here are some examples. This is where I really want to encourage you. When you leave here today, I want you to think about, you know, this is for me. I, I want this. I desire this. 
the multitudes went out to Jesus because they were starving to death. They went to Jesus because they, they, they wanted his word. They needed something. And they followed him and they listened to what he said because they were hungry for him. Amen? Examples. He empowered Bezalel with artistic skills for the construction of the tabernacle and its equipment. He empowered Bezalel, right? Not for him to put his own, you know, addition to his home. Or he really fixed up his garage and made a shiny floor. No, God empowered him to do the work of God. We find this in Exodus 31, verse 3, and Exodus 35, verse 31. He empowers. Now, how about this one? He empowered Joshua with leadership skills and wisdom. Numbers 27, 18. He empowered Joshua with leadership skills and wisdom. Let's check it out. Numbers 27, 18. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Amen? See, Joshua used to be Catholic. He was the son of Nun. I don't make this stuff up, folks. It's right here in your Bible. I didn't say it, only because it's there. Now, get this picture. First of all, the Bible's two things. It's a beautiful story. And number two, it's a story about family. Remember that. It's not about, hey, I'm a believer. I couldn't leave her if I tried. But then I saw her face. Yeah. So what are you trying to say? See, we're trying to understand the greatest story ever told, the redemptive story of God. And we're trying to figure out who is my family in this story and who am I in this family? It's a game changer, but it takes faith to practice this and do it. That's why the church is in a decline. Churches haven't reopened because that's not the purpose. The purpose of a church is to bring people to the Lord in this great story of redemption so they can relate, so they can live it, and then give it to their kids. Because God created the family. Why did he create angels? Because he wanted family. Then some of them are fallen. And what did he do? He created mankind so he could have a family. And that's why we're seeing such challenging times within our families and in our marriages. To the point of even redefining what marriage is, that's what the attacks are. Whatever the enemy is doing, he's doing the opposite of what God wants. A marriage is between a man and a woman. Okay? I don't need a Supreme Court justice to tell me that. God instituted marriage. God is awesome. You know, he's in here right now. No, he's in here. He says, give it to him, Nick. Give it to him. Give it to him. Give it to him, Nick. Give him. Give him everything you got. Give it to him. Right? Listen, I'm only giving to you what I want. You happen to be in the room. No, really. I'm giving to you what I want. But you're in the room. So listen up. I have no time to waste. I just turned 55, right? They say you're over the hill. No, I'm on top. Make sure nobody pushes me over till 60. And all of you that are 60, I'll join you, but then you'll be 65. Now, listen, thank you, Holy Spirit. Why would the priesthood have, like Moses, be leading all of this? Moses leads, he's the deliverer, right? Leads him to the mountain. He's a priest because of the Torah. But now that you have the Torah, leadership changes to Ephraim. Leadership changes to Ephraim. Now, what are you saying, Pastor? Now, here's where the enemy comes in, just so you understand what the enemy's doing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. Think about this. God is trying to put his family back together. So we have the natural branches called the Jews, and the Jews are the chosen people of God. And because of their unbelief, they were broken off so that we could be grafted in. So when you think about the Gentiles, he simply coming to the conclusion of the redemptive plan of God. So for 2,000 years, here's this gospel going out to all the churches, all the Gentiles, because now the icing on the cake, the culmination of it is coming to a head. Because we're not just a believer. We're not just a, a church. We're the Gentiles coming out of the nations called Ephraim. 
And we don't have to argue with the church. We don't have to try to win the church over. We simply are coming out because it's the ecclesia, the called out ones, to what he wants to do through us and through this church. If it was just a family, we would have stayed in the living room. This thing is bigger than me and my wife and my eight kids and all of us in this room. This thing is bigger than all of us, but he's given us an opportunity to be a part of this. I don't know of very many people that are doing what we're doing or seeing what we're seeing. I don't, I don't know very many people. They might have some of it, but they don't have all the pieces like we do. And now there's a contingency going to Israel. After two years of being in COVID, now we're coming out. We're coming out. We're coming out because there's something going to break in the spirit realm. Once they make their way over there and celebrate Shavuot and make the contacts, divine. once that chain of events happens and then they come back, you're going to see a dynamic in here that's going to blow your mind. But we're waiting on it. We're waiting on it. What's the next step, Lord? I said, Beit Tehillah Israel, right? Beit Tehillah Israel, because it's all lining up. I got Hanok coming in June. I got Avi Lipkin coming in July. I got Jeremy Gimbel coming August 4th. What more do you want? I'm telling you, it's just boom, boom, boom. It's, it's happening. He empowered the judges to deliver Israel from their oppressors. Here are some examples. I'm on page two. I'm, I'm down here in my notes here. Othniel in Judges 3.10, he empowered him with his, with his spirit. How about Gideon? Gideon's in the house, right? Little Gideon. Um, that's what I heard. Is he, oh, is he sleeping? No. He, oh, he's looking at me. Gideon, what? Yeah, I saw you in the wine press. Threshing wheat, you mighty man of God. Isn't that funny? He's scared to death. He's threshing wheat in the wine press. And the angel Lord comes to him, you mighty man of God. It's like, I'm a scaredy cat. If this, if this was hide and seek, you would have found me. I lose. <laughs> because see, God thinks more highly of you than you do yourself. I'm just saying, God thinks more highly of you than you do yourself. Thank you. Some of you in here have low self-esteem. You got to get over that. You are a, you, you're the bride. I'm telling you, you're the best of the best. The church wouldn't even have you. You are the best of the best. I was praying over the congregation one time. I said, Lord, I, this congregation, there's, there's a lot, there's, there's some people. And I said, I, I really need your help. I said, you know, I mean, I, I got to minister fairly to everyone. And I, there's some really trying times here, you know, and, 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 and I'm praying, you know, and the Lord said, I gave you my best. I'm like, well, I guess this prayer session is over. And you want me to lead them, right? That's the funny thing, right? I'm leading you. <laughs> That's hilarious. Seriously, I'm leading you. That was never on my resume. I'm going to, you know, have a bowl of cereal, fruits, flakes, and nuts. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have cereal every morning, every service. In Gideon and Judges 6, I want to read Samson in... in in Judges 13, 24 and 25. I just want to read this one little part here, and I think you're going to find this very interesting. In Judges, just, just with the Judges, this one, Samson, and you know, he was a womanizer and a, and a, and a carouser and all that stuff. God used him. <laughs> 13, 24 and 25. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zara and Eshtol. Do you see that? The Spirit of the Lord began to, to move him. He was the last judge. Remember I told you about the modern-day prime ministers versus the judges? I never taught it. I just give you little bits and pieces. But that's unfolding before our very eyes right now with Naphtali Bennett being the prime minister. Very interesting. Because Ehud Olmert was like the 12th prime minister, which equivalent to Samson. Now Naphtali Bennett comes into the picture. And I'm just going to leave you with this. Is he a king, is he a king Saul or is he a, uh, like, a, like a Samuel? What are you saying, Pastor Nick? If you look at the template of those judges versus the prime ministers, I'll, I'll get into it later. But it's just, a, it's just a, a theory, and I'm not sure how it's going to go. But if, if it is correct, 
if it is correct, it's interesting because if, if Samuel is the prophet and Naphtali Bennett is perhaps representative of Samuel the prophet, decent guy, he's for Judea Samaria, a decent guy, right? Then you have King Saul, who's like a picture of the Antichrist, right? He murdered priests, he was jealous. Boy, jealousy is, is a horrible, horrible thing. Jealousy will make you do things you never thought you would do. And that's the work of the flesh. Envy, jealousy, you know, green with envy. What are you, Irish? What's that all about? The green-eyed monster. Now, I'm only telling you this because King David is like the Messiah. So what I'd like to submit to you, because I can't reconfigure the, the template. It is what it is. All I'm saying is that if Naphtali Bennett is Samuel, then the next prime minister won't be good. Not only that, but it could actually propel the Messiah to come back. Only time will tell on this theory because I don't want to be called a false prophet. It's just the template. It's a theory. And it all started back in, I want to say, 1998 in the fall in my, at my dining room table. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to compare the modern-day prime ministers to the judges. And I went, oh, okay. That's back in 1998. So how many years is that? 24 years. So, so I'm just saying it's a theory. It's going to be interesting how it plays out. Isn't God exciting? See, if you break yourself from the culture in your phone, God's going to download stuff in you that you never dreamed of. His world. Amen? It's his world, the spiritual realm. That's why, you know, you're, you're, you're a natural man, too. You know, you got your, your natural man, your natural faculties, you know, your, your five senses, you know. So what I'm saying is that when you really purpose to get into the things of God and different things, I'm telling you, you're going to feel different, be different. And then when you see those things in the world, they're like a bad taste in your mouth. Like, that doesn't interest me. Or that doesn't entertain me. You know, like certain movies, you know, I would say, oh, no, that, 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 that didn't entertain me because we are looking for entertainment. But when you get to the point where you're like watching something, like, oh, this doesn't entertain me, you just turn it off, you're probably at another level. But that used to entertain you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when we think about the word spirit, it's the Hebrew word ruach, and it means the following, wind, by resemblance breath, a sensible or even violent exhalation, figurative of life. The word used to refer to the spirit of God or the Lord. And you'll find this right there in, in the Old Testament. See, nobody knows where it comes and where it goes, like the wind. That's what the Holy Spirit does. See, amen? So he empowered David, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Empowerment, he empowered David. 1 Samuel 16, 30. Let's read it. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Amen? The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. And as I read this and I say, I go, Lord, let the Holy Spirit come upon Nick. Let the Holy Spirit come upon Libby. Right? Later, after their return from exile, God put his spirit in the midst of them to protect them and keep them from fear. This is Haggai 2.5. Haggai 2.5. Solomon's doing good on the PowerPoints. Amen. Haggai 2.5. Let's read it. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. How many of the last two years with this whole COVID thing, there's a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of fear over the price of gasoline. There's fear over you can't get milk. You know, who would ever thought they'd see the day where you go to Walmart and there's no toilet paper? None of us saw that coming. Nobody saw that coming. It's crazy. So as we come out of COVID, we're going into something really exciting and good and new. If you ever get a chance, go back and look at my teaching or ask for the PowerPoints, call the office, we'll email it to you. After a plague, there's great opportunities. Would you not agree? Yeah. 
There are great opportunities happening right now. All kinds of cool things are happening. Think about it, right? You don't have to show a COVID test to go to Israel. You don't have to wear a mask on the plane. It's a praise report. Woo. Get out the peanuts and the ginger ale. We're going to party because I can't eat peanuts with a mask on. Does that make any sense to be on the plane? And when you're eating and drinking, you take your mask off. Is it like the five-second rule? Your mask can only be down for five seconds, only two peanuts at a time. And chew with the mask up. I mean, I'm just saying, I, it's the things that we just look at and go, this doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't. Praise God. I love Samuel. Haggai. Now, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is seen first and most fully in his anointing of Yeshua as the Messiah. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. Yeah. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, what I love about this, this shows me the proof of a Godhead. I'm not saying Trinity, Godhead. I believe in the Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? So it's right there in front of us. Another thing that I am, am going to help you out with is this. The enemy wants to twist and pervert all the things of God, and he wants to counterfeit a lot of things. Those lower Elohim want you to just pull away from Yahweh and do all this other stuff. But I find it interesting that in the book of Revelation, we have the false Godhead. We have the dragon, right? The beast, the antichrist, and the false prophet. Why would the devil do that? Because there is a Godhead. I'm willing to even go a step further and admit something to you that you're probably saying, I'm glad you said it because I didn't want people to think I was crazy. I've personally experienced the Godhead, each individual one coming into my life. Let me tell you something. When I got saved and born again, the, the, Jesus was so powerful. I mean, not that I really physically saw him, but Jesus was like in my room when I got saved. I didn't say, wow, that was the Holy Spirit. That was God. No, it was like the Son of God came in my room. Amen? I've been at times where the, my Father in heaven would, would want to correct me or do something, and it wasn't Jesus, and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. Amen? What about an unction? Like all of a sudden, you're sitting there and someone says, hey, call this person. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't God. It was the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not claiming three gods. You know that the Jews believe that we serve three gods. But we don't. We serve the Godhead. We serve the Godhead. I'm telling you, God just messes with people. He comes as a theophany, you know? Did you know that the elders ate with God up on Mount Sinai? They ate with, it says it right there. Abraham had lunch with God. So how he appeared is how he wanted to appear. He can morph into anything, a small child, an adult. He can do whatever he wants, right? I just, I'm working on the Matthew Island. He's walking on water. Why? Because he can. Because he's bigger and badder and better than walking on water. He's over that. I know. Interesting storyline. I mean, now, real quickly here, this is what's so incredible to me. If you look at the time of Yeshua, Zeus was over everything. He was the chief god, Zeus. Jesus dethroned him. More people believe in Jesus than Zeus. So, so this Greek mythology is twisted, it's perverted. There's sexual immorality involved, half human, half God involved. How many am I talking about? Everything's perverted, twisted. But not our God. Our God is a God of love. He's a God of responsibility. Hear me out on this. Please hear me out on this. Think about it. God made us. 
He made us. Tim, did you ask to be here? Was you in a pool of muck and then evolved or something? I mean, did you say, hey, I want to go down there, be a human. I want to be a homo sapien. You had nothing to do with being here because God created you. But now that you're here, what are you going to do? So God made us, we messed up, and he gives us a way out. I talk about this all the time with the Lord. I say, you are the coolest God. You kicked us out of the garden. We got death and sickness, but then you want to marry us. You're awesome. I'm sorry we, we jilted you at the altar. I'm sorry we left you and committed adultery and all these things. Gosh, Lord, I mean, then you had to come down and take care of yourself. You ever done that? If you want something done, do it yourself. So God says, I'm going down there, and I'm going to straighten it out. That's what he did in the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Here comes the right hand of God, Jesus Christ. And he comes down, and he's got to do all these things like the children of Israel. You know, he's got to go to Egypt, just like the children of Israel. He's got to come out of Egypt like the children of Israel. He's got to be, do a mikvah just like the children of Israel did going through the sea. He's got to do all these things, experience all these things, and have a ministry, suffer, die, and be buried, and rise again, and that's our God. Wow. He, like, proved himself. He doesn't pop in and pop out, beat me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. He didn't do that. He literally took responsibility. He said, I made you and you screwed up and you messed up. I'm going to save you because I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I want to be with Carolyn forever. I'm 55. All this is real to me now, folks. <laughs> They're talking about raising the retirement age in France to 65. I don't live in France, but I'm just saying... How much time do I have left? I love what Paul did. Paul says, I ran the race. I did everything the Lord wanted me to do. That's what I want to say. Lord, I did everything you told me to do. I did it. Wasn't perfect, wasn't good. I missed it sometimes. But Lord, I've done, I've done what you've asked me to do. And that's how I feel right now at this point in time. I'm doing what God has told me to do. And it's getting more better. It's getting more better. Because we're in empowerment right now. I'm going to be your motivational speaker today. The Holy Spirit also empowered Yeshua's disciples for various kinds of ministry. Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. This, this gospel is going to go out, amen? Because it's time to come home. Because remember, to the uttermost part of the earth. Now, the lower Elohim was put over the nations. Remember the Tower of Babel? God created the nations. Remember the 70 nations? He scattered the people and created nations. But the nation of Israel belongs to God. So now what he's basically saying 2,000 years ago through the justification of the cross through Jesus Christ He's like, I'm coming for my children. I'm wanting my children to come out of the nations and come to me now. See, this is why you're seeing tyranny and tyrants and dictators in North Korea and Syria and all these horrible, horrible things that are happening as far as dictator, because it's the lower Elohim influencing these leaders. Remember the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece? There are Elohim over these nations, why would, why would you know, Putin go into Ukraine? He's not even a military-minded man. He's KGB, Secret Service, you know. No plan, just go. Wasn't coordinated right now. Look, now, now it, it backfired. Well, you know, they're to the, we're trying to you know, build a big buffer zone against NATO or something. But you're going to see some of these nations doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Because the lower Elohim is causing havoc. Because they know Yahweh's coming. The word power is the Greek word dunamis, and it means the following. Miraculous power, ability, abundance, strength, and violence. Violence. Do you know that? Violence to the dark side. Violence to the demons. Getting them out of people's lives. Saying enough's enough, Amen. So in general, we can say that the Holy Spirit speaks through the gospel message as it is effectively proclaimed to people's hearts. Acts 4.8, Acts 
Acts 4, 31. Acts 6, verse 10. We have 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. We'll just look at a few of these verses. Are you guys ready? Come on, somebody. Acts 4, 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Now, what's empowering him? The Holy Spirit. What's empowering a lot of people in the world today? Their emotions or familiar spirits or the cult of personality. Here, Peter's filled with the Holy Ghost. So he's empowered. Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. 1 Thessalonians 1.5, here's Paul. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. This empowers you. Empowers you. If you go back and look at Acts chapter 2, you're going to find a bunch of languages in different geographical areas and stuff, even all the way up to Spain, because remember, when God scattered the nations, that's where they went. So God's almost like blowing the whistle. <whistles> come home. It's time to come back. And every man heard in his own language. Because we used to always wonder about that. Dr. Michael Heiser does a very good teaching on that. Nothing's by happenstance or an accident or just a whim. No, there was a reason why those people spoke the languages and they understood it. Because God's saying, it's time to come back to me. It's time to come back to me. So if God's got a storybook and you're in it, you got to play the part. You know what I'm saying? you got to play that part for today. You're the character. I'll never forget what Angus said to me, Angus Wooten, who passed away. He's like Moses with his hair and everything, you know. I mean, I thought I was talking to Moses or Aaron, you know. He's like, son, let me tell you something. Life's a stage, and when the curtain's pulled back, you better know your part. <laughs> And I was like, that was good. That was good, right? What's my role? What's my part? And guess what? There's something for everybody. You don't have to be jealous or wish they were her or him. I'm Nick, and there's nobody else like me. And I know you say, hey, man, I heard you over here. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I don't have to be anybody else. I'm Nick. I'm Nick. Angie called me Nicky. Nick. Nick. When spiritual gifts are active, it is another indication of the presence of God or empowerment. Let me say that again. When spiritual gifts are active, it is another indication of the presence of God. Whether it's being inspired to share up here in the pulpit, it's an indication of the presence of God. Did you notice how it all ties in together? A word of encouragement. You know you've experienced empowerment. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. The Holy Spirit's here for you to profit. Right? It empowers. Given to every man. I used to listen to Eddie Chum, and he'd come and teach and share. I was like, man, I wish I could know what he knows. Now I do. All I had to do was the time. I go, how do, you, how do you learn all these verses and you just open your Bible and go to and fro and you just connect everything? How do you do that? He goes, oh, this is a keyword study Bible to me, right? So I learn from him and then I give it to you. This keyword study Bible is probably is one of the best Bibles I've ever had to grow exponentially and to mature and to really know the scriptures because many will go to and fro and knowledge will increase, meaning the plan of God. My goodness, how many prophecies are here that we haven't even touched on yet? And they're, they're coming to pass because we missed them. <laughs> I'm just saying, one-third of your Bible's prophecy. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. We're still in 1 Corinthians 12. But all these worketh that one and the same, or self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Notice that we all have gifts. We all have talents. Amen? 
We all have gifts. We all have talents. But all these work at that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. We're still in empowerment. Boy, there's a lot of stuff going on here, isn't there? This empowerment's got a lot of stuff. The Holy Spirit empowers people to overcome spiritual opposition to the preaching of the gospel and God's work in people's lives. This power in spiritual warfare was first seen in the life of Yeshua, Matthew 12, 28. Let's read it. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. See, if you just become obedient, just change a few things in your life, and you become obedient, those spirits leave your life. They're not a part anymore. See, they're not a part of my life. That's, that's what I said. You're not a part of my life anymore. I'm obedient, and they go away. Nobody prayed for me. Nobody did anything, didn't put oil on my forehead. I just noticed that I felt better. That spirit was gone. That bad habit was gone. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul confronts Elymas, the sorcerer, in Acts chapter 13, verses 4 through 12. Do we have the occult going on in America? It's everywhere. Here's Acts chapter 13, verses 8 through 11. Here's the story. Let's read it. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. And said, O fool of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Blindness came upon the sorcerer. It's interesting, you know, Moses had to be filled with the Holy Spirit to know what? He told Korah what was going to happen to him before it happened. The earth was going to swallow them up. And what happened the next day? The earth swallowed them up. See, it's so important that you understand something. In the Hebrews of the Christian faith movement, we have to do it his way. You can't be dogmatic you got to do this thing his way. It's Yahweh. So I can't take this movement to make it to be what I want, what fits me, what's my personality, what's my liking. No, he's doing stuff here that I never dreamed of doing. Never even crossed my mind because his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. So when I tell you the Jewish people are coming from Israel to our church, they're coming. They've already come. They're coming again and again and again. Here we go. The gift of distinguishing between spirits in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, given by the Holy Spirit is also to be a tool in this warfare against the forces of darkness, as is the word of God, which functions as the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, in spiritual conflict. So why is this so important? Remember, there's only one Holy Spirit, but there are other spirits. There's other spirits. 1 Corinthians 12.10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, divers kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, I'm not saying this to be prideful or anything, but I've been given the gift of the discernment of spirits. Now, some people don't get that, and they don't believe me. I'm like, this person has a spirit. No, 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 Nick, no. I'm like, listen... I have a discernment of spirits, and red flag comes up. Now, how many of that's a cursing and a blessing at the same time? Because now you're being warned about somebody, and you have to appropriate that in your life. Not to shout it out and blurt it out, but I'm only telling you this because he gave it to me to help to protect this church. That's the only reason. And I'm trying to establish something so you understand. Because i got to rise up to the title. i got to rise up to the gifts and the things that he's given me. They asked me to be the worship leader. I love music. I have the gift of music. And so my dad played the guitar. You know, 
I play the guitar. You see my son playing the guitar. So, so they, I, I, they asked me to be the worship leader, and uh, I said, I can play Time in a Bottle by Jim Croce. And they go, no, we don't want that. We need some Jesus songs. Matter of fact, here's, here's a tape uh, of a lot of songs in E minor, in A minor, and uh, we want you to learn these. So what I'm trying to tell you, as, as I began to be given some mantles and positions, it, it, it evolved even to the point of we had a modern-day prophet come, Jonas Clark, and he was in the congregation, and at one point he pulled my mother-in-law and my father-in-law over to the side, and he pulled me close and said, this man here is the prophet of the house. And I said, really? He says, you're the prophet of this house. You're going to protect it because other prophets and false prophets are going to try to come in, but there will already be a mantle on you to prevent that from happening. We don't have false prophets in here. Have you noticed that? You don't have people just prophesying false prophets. And the Lord said, and I'm like, no, he didn't. <laughs> Go sit down. We don't have that problem here, do we? Because you got to fill the position because if you don't, the devil will fill it. If you don't fill that position, the devil will fill it. We've been very fortunate in this church, haven't we? You guys have been with me a long time. He protects this house through leadership, through ministries, okay? And you got to be all on one page. Come on. Yeah. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. <laughs> See? The devil came to Jesus and tried to tempt him. And Jesus didn't say, hey, devil, you know what I think? I was reading a People magazine about you. And, you know, he didn't do that. He quoted the word. Because that's the only thing that works. If the Bible says it, we believe it. Amen? Now, that's the first thing. I hope you feel empowered right now. I'm going to go build a tabernacle or something. I'm going to get Tim to help me because he's got all the skills. I'll just hand him the tools and get the credit or something. I don't know. But, but like, I want to go build something or do something, man. I want to go take a country or something. I just found out through my family tree that we used to have Plummer Island. I want to find it. And I'm going to take it back, me ladies. <laughs> Number two, the Holy Spirit purifies. Oh, this is where it gets a little painful. OxyClean. You know, it's funny. There's like levels of OxyClean. Have you noticed that in the store? There's OxyClean and there's Super OxyClean. Mega OxyClean. One of his primary activities is to cleanse us from sin and to sanctify us or make us more holy in actual conduct of life. Wow. 1 Corinthians 6.11, let's read it. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So you can ask for these things. Holy Spirit, purify me. The washing of the water of the word. Lord, purify me, cleanse me, make me into a better person, a better place to be. He brings the fruit of the Spirit within us and those qualities that reflect the character of God. Galatians 5, through 23. Let's read it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. If you do these things, nobody will say you're guilty of sin or not doing the Torah. Because the Torah tells us what sin is. The law teaches us what sin is. When we know what sin is, we can choose not to do it and have the fruit of the Spirit instead. Whew. Such a cliche, you know. You know, it's such a cliche, these, these, like, these things. But if you really look at them, they're good. They're really good. So sanctification comes by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.18, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, and Romans chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. So let's go into 2 Corinthians 3.18. You ready? But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Aren't you being changed? I don't have those habits that I used to have. Amen? I got new ones. No. Think about the things you used to do and you got over it. Amen? You're like, man, I'm better now. I'm glad I quit that, you know? Little things. 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. 
Boy, Paul had his work cut out for him. And look at Peter. Peter's got this incredible stuff of sanctification of the Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. Romans 8 is the flesh versus the Spirit. Remember, a lot of this stuff ties in from last week. That's why I kept that up there. Take up your cross. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It is by the Spirit that we are able to put to death the deeds of the body and grow in personal holiness. Now, notice you've got to make the right decisions. You've got this evil inclination. You've got your you know, natural man. Now you're born again. You're supposed to be a new creation. So I'm saying you're just going to have to make better decisions, everybody. Have you just done that? I remember one time I, I, I ate some cottage cheese, and I had some stuff in it. It was great. A little bowl of cottage cheese, and I said, that was good. I'm going to go make a meatloaf sandwich because that's what I wanted. I'm going to go make me a meatloaf sandwich. And I stopped and I said, you know what? I just had a big bowl of cottage cheese. I'm not doing the meatloaf sandwich. I said, no, I'm not doing it. And I went to bed. It's the little things that you train yourself in. Amen? It's the little things, you know. It's like, you know, when I go to the Hebrews Cafe, I just get a little Coke. I don't think get three Cokes. I don't get a 12-ounce, 16-ounce. It's just a little. You, you pop the top, that little... Coca-Cola goes in your mouth, and it's gone. But it's all in moderation. It's you training yourself. I don't do, you know, four spoonfuls of sugar in my coffee. I just do two. <laughs> two. No, but I'm t- that trains you in the spirit. Because if you'll listen to any, or if you'll eat anything, you'll listen to anything. In Romans 8, 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That's encouraging. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Meaning you actually live your life. You're going to live. It wasn't one of those songs. I live for him. I live now because of his Spirit, because of him. In Psalm 51, 10, here's King David. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Wow, have you ever wondered about that? A right spirit within me. Renew a right spirit within me. You know what that means in the Hebrew? A constant spirit. He had one moral failure, one moral lapse to be with Bathsheba and get her pregnant, and then he murdered Uriah. We can't even go into that because you reap what you sow. Remember that? You reap what you sow. Renew a right spirit within me, a constant spirit. You don't just put your, the Holy Spirit behind you and grieve and quench it. You, you put it with you, you keep it with you. And you, you realize, hey, I need the Holy Spirit on this. Amen? Oh, man, you guys are doing so good. The Holy Spirit empowers, the Holy Spirit purifies. You are halfway through seminary. The Holy Spirit reveals, I think this is one of the best ones. The whole of the Old Testament scriptures came about because men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21, think about it. 66 books in the Bible and it all goes together. Different people, different characters. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Think about the Messianic Psalms that King David played and created. The Messianic Psalms, the mosaic of the Messiah, the scriptures. You take this verse and you take that verse and you put it together and you see the Messiah. And that's how the enemy was defeated because the enemy wasn't that smart to take the mosaics of the scriptures and put them together to see the person of Jesus. They just didn't get it or they never would have killed him. This is why a lot of people will study the Bible and say, well, I'll look for Messiah, I'll look for this, but how many know he's a servant? He's a king. So the mosaic of Jesus is really, it's, it's a lot of things, a lot of prophecies that you got to put in there that you'll start reading and think, ooh, that was good. I've discovered some of that, amen? He gives evidence of God's presence in Numbers 11, verses 25 and 26, in John chapter 1, verse 32, in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. He reveals, and not all the examples are here, but we'll look at a number of them. Check this out. Are you ready? Numbers 11, verses 25 and 26. 
And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. Is that in the Old Testament? What? Listen, thank you, Holy Spirit. God will never empower you by his Holy Spirit to do that which is wrong. Let me say that again. God will never empower you with his Holy Spirit for you to do something that is wrong or out of his will. He won't do it. So what's going to happen is, thank you, Holy Spirit, he's going to empower us so that we can go forward as Ephraim and meet up with Judah. He's going to empower us, and we're going to get the favor of kings and queens and, and the Knesset and the government, and we're going to be able to come together and do all these things because it was already prophesied, because it takes two to tango. Right? Thank you, Holy Spirit. I did a study on Ephraim and Judah. Do it for yourself. When Ephraim and Judah come together, the enemy is defeated and scattered and beat like a dog. This is why sometimes we can have a hard time personally or here because we need Judah and Judah needs us. But when we have this certain unity and we come alongside the Jewish people, then God does the rest. This word prophesied is naba. It means to prophesy, speak or sing by inspiration in prediction or simple discourse. Speak or sing by inspiration, amen? That's what prophesied means. Let's continue on in verse 26 of Numbers. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. And they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. I can relate to this one guy, me, Dad. You, Dad, me, Dad. So God's doing something. We got to be careful because you don't want to create cliques in the church because these two guys weren't really on the itinerary but they were in on it because they jumped. They, they were at the right place at the right time. They started prophesying. And when Joshua was like, hey, hey, and when Moses, he comes back and says, I wish all of Israel would prophesy. Wow. I told you people would be coming in off the street in the church, and it's happening. It's true. In Kings, in 1 Kings 8, that prayer of dedication of Solomon, that, that prayer that even goes today where God's name is in the Temple Mount, he prays this prayer. He says, he says to, to every man, to Israel and the stranger, Say, that's everyone. Who, who's not going to fall into that category? It actually says that in, in Jeremiah, told them, I'll raise up, what? Shepherds after my own heart. And what the Lord was showing me that I need to tell these pastors about Israel, the Jews are the chosen people, and we need to be praying for them, and they, need, they have a right to a state, the right to living in their communities, that when these evangelical pastors get on board, they have God's heart. In John chapter 1, verse 32, and John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Was it revealed? It was seen, it was written, documented. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the word it. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. It's like the menorah, the personal pronoun his. His knops, his bowls, his lamps. It's the personal pronoun he, his. The menorah is not confused in what it is. It's a his. It's not a his and hers, hers and his. I don't know what the menorah is. Is it male or female? It's male. His knobs, his bowls. You see what I'm saying? It. He guides and directs God's people in Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Acts chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Acts chapter 11, verse 12. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. Once again, this is about revealing. In other contexts, the Holy Spirit gave direct words of guidance to people saying to Philip, for example, go up and join this chariot, Acts 8, 29, or telling Peter to go with three men who came to him from Cornelius' household, Acts chapter 10, verses 19 through 29, 
Acts chapter 11, verse 12, or directing the Christians at Antioch, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Do you see these instructions? Do you see it? He provides a godlike atmosphere when he manifests his presence because he wants to reveal himself. See, God wants to reveal himself. God wants to reveal himself. God wants to reveal himself. Because the Holy Spirit is fully God and shares all the attributes of God, his influence will be to bring a godlike character or atmosphere to the situations in which he is active. Because he is the Holy Spirit, he will at times bring about a conviction of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You know, when people would say, the services are too long, is your sin list too long? I told you that the hours in a week, we talked about that, didn't we? There's 24 hours in a day times seven. What is the percentage of time that we go to church corporately? Because look around, this is heaven. This is eternity. I'm telling you, there's more eternity here than Walmart. No, really. This is eternity. When you start getting that, that mindset, it changes everything. See, it, it's, a, it's a mindset. I think it's 3%. You sleep more, you work more, you probably watch TV more, you're probably on your phone more than even being together. And we cry about that. Just trying to help you. Numbers don't lie. Numbers don't lie. Yesterday's gone. That time is gone. I can't get it back. I only have the present. There's the past and the future. It's a present. It's now. It's a present. In John 16, verses 8 and 11, once again, I'm reading these verses tomorrow at Freedom Square. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. you got to break this down. This is what the Holy Spirit is. I want you to understand this. Convict the world of sin, right? Because what? They believe not on me. Why would Jesus come? But because of sin. So when you realize that there is sin and Jesus came, that's a winner. And the Holy Spirit comes for what? For righteousness. To prove what? Now Jesus can go back to the Father and be our righteousness. Do you get it? So you're always reflecting on Jesus. Well, I sinned, but he came for me. And now my righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. And the ruler of this world is judged. What do you have to fear? Nothing. Nothing. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? Clipso. Come on, everybody. Now hear me out on this. Have you ever been in a bout of depression and can't come out of it? You're out of the kingdom of God. You've lost your what? You've lost your peace. Have you not laughed in a few days or a week? Not really had a good laughter or laughter? You're out of the kingdom of God. Do you reflect on the righteousness of Christ? Or have you not done it? You're out of the kingdom of God. He gives us assurance. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, Romans 8, 16, and gives evidence of the work of God within us. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 24. He reveals, Romans 8, 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You're worth something. You might not feel good. You might be going through something physically, but the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Amen? 1 John 3, 24. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. It's revealed. 
He teaches and he illumines. He illumines, shines the light on something, gives you something to see. Another aspect of the Holy Spirit's revealing work is teaching certain things to God's people and illumining them so that they can understand things. Yeshua promised this teaching function, especially to his disciples when he said that the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. John 14, 26. And said, he will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. Amen. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. In the Hebrew roots of the Christian faith movement, this is where we have erred. The Holy Spirit is going to bring to remembrance the words of Jesus, not the Torah in the Old Testament. Can he do that? Yes, But we spend so much time in the Torah and and, and the prophets that we don't even listen and remember what Jesus said. Did he say, turn the what? Turn the other what? Cheek. Oh, I got to do that? I got to love my brother? What? Can't love him? What? The Holy Spirit's going to bring to all the things that the Lord had said. Think about all the parables and all the things. But we don't even bring that up. But we know the commandments. You're eating pork chops. But you don't even know the parable about the hidden treasure in the field. I know. Because here, you see, the New Testament is really a reflection on everything that he's done. But when you get in that Old Testament, you got to be careful because you're like, hey, I don't do pagan holidays. I don't cut down a perfectly good tree and bring it in my house. Right? But do you know the parable about the ten virgins? Maybe you're foolish. Maybe you're half of them. I don't know. I don't know. John, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. This illuminating work of the Holy Spirit is seen in the fact that he enables us to understand We have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is from God, that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. 1 Corinthians 2.12. Therefore, the unspiritual man does not receive the gifts, literally things of the spirit of God, but the spiritual man judges all things. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 14 and 15. We should pray that the Holy Spirit would give us his illumination and thereby help us to understand rightly when we study scripture or when we ponder situations in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. Now we, have not, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. You're going to judge whether it's spiritual or natural. Do you see that? There's too many choices out there. There's just too many things to consume. So much of a variety of food and drink and shows and music. It's like a buffet. Amen? I remember taking a disc and putting it into the computer and downloading pictures on this disc. And we have 35,000 pictures. That was years ago. Now I have the cloud. Come on, somebody. I ain't putting no pictures on no disc unless I want to make a Frisbee. Last one. Listen, I know, I know I'm long-winded. You don't have to tell me that. I just have to give to you what God told me to give to you. I wish it could be shorter and sweeter and a little fish story, but I have to just be obedient. And when I leave here, I feel like I've given birth. My wife laughs like, you have no idea. You have no idea. Go to your room. You are, you're, you're not right. I'm telling you, if, if, 
if men had to have babies, there wouldn't be any population. There wouldn't be any babies. There wouldn't be no babies. What's wrong, honey? The wife said, what's wrong, honey? What's wrong? I, th I think I've got the sniffles. Oh, my gosh, i got to lay down. I've got sniffles. This one nostril's got some snot in it. I, I, just shut the door, shut the door. Where's my eye patch? <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's true. We're going to finish up with the Holy Spirit unifies. We're going to finish up. This is it. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, there is an emphasis on the Holy Spirit coming on a community of believers, not just a leader like Moses or Joshua, but sons and daughters, old men and young men, men servants and maid servants, all will receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in this time. Whew. Wow. In Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Pastor Russell took pictures of the blood red moon last Sunday night. Took pictures of the blood red moon. What are you saying, Pastor Nick? Okay, the Holy Spirit's moving in here. Our sons and daughters are prophesying, speaking the very oracles of God. Young men have visions, fresh revelation from God, and old men are dreaming dreams. But guess what else the Lord is saying? There's going to be signs in the heavens too to match what the Holy Spirit's doing. Remember the four blood red moons for the, those feast days? It's like God was saying, I've restored the feast days. Look at these blood red moons that fall on the feast days. Why was it a sign in the heaven? Because he's doing it on the earth. What happens when you miss the stop sign? You could die. Paul blesses the Corinthian church with a blessing that seeks the unifying fellowship of the Holy Spirit for all of them when he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, uh, Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. Check out 2 Corinthians 13, 14. We're, we're bringing it home here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. The communion of the Holy Ghost. Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Quick cause and problems. The idea that the Holy Spirit unifies the church is also evident in the fact that strife, disputes, dissensions, and factions, Galatians 5.20, are desires of the flesh that are opposed to being led by the Spirit, Galatians 5, verses 18 to 25. The Holy Spirit is the one who produces love in our hearts, Romans 5.5, 5, Galatians 5.22, Colossians 1.8, and this love binds everything together in perfect harmony, Colossians 3.14. Therefore, when the Holy Spirit is working strongly in a church to manifest God's presence, one evidence will be a beautiful harmony in the church community and overflowing love for one another. I've heard it said that if you've been in a church for at least eight years, you're staying. Raise your hand if you've been here for eight years. Look at that. See, I'm not worried about you. It's funny. Isn't that a funny saying? It's a good observation. If you've been somewhere eight years, you're probably going to stay. Galatians 5, 18 through 25, remember this? The old works of the flesh, remember that thing when you wake up in the morning? But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, 
envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen? It's interesting. Joseph was 17 when he was thrown into the pit. He was, a little, he was full of himself, wasn't he? He's kind of full of himself a little bit. 17 years old, works of the flesh, you know, telling his dreams and making, hey, look at me, big boy. You get thrown in a pit. 17. 17 works of the flesh. Romans 5.5. 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Cry out to the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.8, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. I'm sorry, I don't have the words. I just thought I'd sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> Whew. Wow. Colossians 3.14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Wow. I'd like to thank all of you for taking my class today. All of you get an A+. Plus. Amen. And I just want to make an announcement. There'll be no summer school for any of you. Yeah, let's close it out with this. Last slide. Here we go. Four aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit to bring evidence of God's presence and to bless. The Holy Spirit empowers. The Holy Spirit purifies. The Holy Spirit reveals. The Holy Spirit unifies. If you're interested in getting the Systematic Theology book, it's in the marketplace, and it's very, very interesting. So I think over a thousand pages, of different subjects found in the Bible that if you're interested in, jump right in there. So Father, we thank you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, let this not just be something that just gets by us, Father, for we know that you need us to have your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh upon every person here, every person watching right now, Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit would manifest and empower us, purify us, reveal things to us, and unify us. And I love in, in John, uh, it says that in the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. That means that the Holy Spirit will warn us of danger or something happening. So Father, we know that right now some people have to, have to find a place to live. They need to move. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you'd reveal it to them. Father, there are those that are looking for a job. I pray, Father, right now that you would just cover them with your Holy Spirit and give them the job that you want them to have, to bring a light into that place. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that is going to show us things to come because they are glorious. They are promises of you. Just like Bill Carter said, Father, we are fulfilling prophecies. And we ask all this in the name of Yeshua of Nazareth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody. You guys are awesome.